Okay guys, next we'll get into hypertension medications. So these will be medications that are designed to lower uh, blood pressure. So uh, what we often see with most medications um, in general, especially for blood pressure, uh, we'll often see two medications prescribed. Uh, we'll go over kind of what we typically see um, in terms of prescription. But the, the reason being is that with smaller amounts of medication, um, we have less side effects. So instead of giving one large bolus of one med, if we give two smaller ones, right, they may have different effects that we may want to, you know, treat. Um, and uh, we'll have less of a chance for that spillover, right? You know, the, those other receptors that may, um, that, that drug may bind to. So by giving two smaller dosages versus one larger dosage, we may have less effects because the size of the of a dosage, you know, or the bolus of a medication, the larger that gets, the higher the likelihood we have of having a side effect. So by giving two meds, we may uh, reduce the risk of side effects because there are lesser amounts, and they may work different ways. Maybe you want to do, uh, you know, work on the the RAS system. So we'll give an ACE inhibitor, or maybe you work on sympathetic um, activities. So we'll give a beta blocker. So uh, I'm not expecting you guys to know this by heart. This is from the JNC8, and it kind of walks through what physicians uh, will look at uh, in terms of when this, when and what type of medication to prescribe. So. Uh, again, the JNC-8 is a little bit different in terms of the blood pressure goals. Again, AHA, ACC are using 120. Um, and as again, you can see, they still reinforce lifestyle medication. And then, you know, they carefully titrate our lifestyle interventions, right? And adherence and imagine they carefully titrate up the dosages, right? So everyone, when they get a medication, the, you know, you know they, it's kind of a trial and error, again, saying that people's Physiology is a little bit different. So everyone processes meds a little bit differently um, than the next person. So, you know, drugs are gradually often titrated or maybe over, you know, a, a month or so to see how a patient responds initially. Um, and then here's just, again, some of the different medications that you may see a patient be given uh, to treat hypertension. And again, it's the goal um, is what we're seeing for, for blood pressures for the, uh, the AHA's guidelines. So, um, Hypertension, again, it's, you know, we're, we're our goals for meds for this are to treat elevated blood pressure. Different guidelines out there, the ACC, American College of Cardiology, and the AHA, JNCA, I showed you guys those. Majority of patients will get two meds. We talked about why, because of the lower concentration, you know, larger, less amount of meds, lower risk of complications. And then each drug, which we'll get into, does different things. So maybe we want to have a two-pronged attack versus just a single-pronged attack. And most often, patients have multiple different things or systems that are contributing to the elevated blood pressure. So uh, quite often, patients will start with some sort of, some sort of diuretic, um, a thiazide-type diuretic. We'll get into that in a bit. And then uh, often, we're seeing ACE inhibitors, uh, which block angiotensin-converting enzyme, um, as the first two choices. But uh, there's other options available out there, beta blockers and, and, and calcium channel blockers. We'll get into those as well. And most of them operate by either, uh, you know, reducing um, systematic uh, sorry, systemic vascular resistance or total peripheral resistance, right, or decreasing contractility, um, right, to decrease blood pressure. And that's kind of how they, most of them operate. Now, diuretics, um, if you kind of break down the root word, it's to, you know, move fluid out of the body. Uh, these reduce blood pressure, <coughs> excuse me by reducing blood volume through the kidneys. The, there's three common types. You'll learn a lot more about these later on, but we've got loop, thiazide, and aldosterone receptor antagonists, right? So loop diuretics, uh, the most common one you'll see uh, is furosomide or Lasix. So a little bit of a little bit of insight. Uh, there is always the generic brand, which are these really technical, funny sounding words here. And then the, the brand name, um, which is the manufacturer who most often, um, you know, you know, produces this matter or owns the patent for it. Um, so Lasix is the brand name for forosomide, which is the generic version. Um, uh, it 
blocks resorption of, of electrolytes, sodium, potassium, chloride at the loop of Henle. So wherever sodium kind of goes, water typically goes. So that um, blocks that resorption of fluid. And we end up moving that out through excretion, through urination, out of, you know, you know, through the kidneys into the bladder, out of the body. Um, we have a high ceiling. So if patients, for example, with like heart failure, for you know, who have or holding on to a lot of fluid, we'll give them a diuretic to you know to get that fluid out. But they're often used as well for hypertension. Uh, thiazide diuretics um, similarly also block uh, sodium resorption, but at the distal tube of the nephron. Um, same thing, if we block the resorption of sodium, that water still come, or moves along with that sodium, and we excrete it out of the kidneys, we don't reabsorb resorb it back into the bloodstream, continues on to the bladder to be excreted, and we reduce blood volume. Uh, the most common thiazide diuretic is hydrochlorothiazide. Again, that's the generic brand. Um, you'll often see this abbreviated because it's really hard to say hydrochlorothiazide really, really quickly. You'll see it's HCTZ, um, and then the most common brand name is Esidrex. I think it's probably, well, probably the leading choice of drugs for a central hypertension. Um, now, both loop and thiazide diuretics have a risk of hypokalemia, um, even though so thiazide is really more to block the, 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 the sodium resorption they can leach out a good bit of potassium. And again, if we lose potassium, we can end up having membrane potential stability problems, uh, especially in the heart, which can lead to arrhythmias. So uh, there are other meds like uh, DOS receptor agonists. Um, most commonly one we'll see is spirolactone um, and brand name aldactone, which is a potassium sparing diuretic. So it'll move out um, fluid but we won't lose that potassium. Um, so it's maybe a little bit safer in terms of that, that risk for hypokalemia and other complications related to hypokalemia. Quite often, loop and thiazide are direct patients on these may be prescribed the potassium supplements. You might see that in their medical chart um, with these two meds, but you don't have to worry about that with this one here. And then we'll get into sympathetics. These are kind of a, a family of meds. Um, so sympathetics, now an easy way to remember most meds is you'll see a suffix. Beta blockers have a suffix of olol, or you can think LOL, laugh out loud, or olol. Um, these work to reduce blood pressure by reducing sympathetic tone, right, which will reduce heart rate, reduce blood pressure by reducing contractility. These are primarily going after those beta-1 receptors in the heart, right? Um, they also have some antiarrhythmic properties by stabilizing the membrane potential. Um, in some low dosages, you might actually see them as anti-anxiety meds um, because it helped, you know, that biofeedback process of reducing sympathetic nervous system activity or tone. Um, and we often see this prescribed after an MI because we think reducing sympathetic activity, um, it, you know, that is linked to, you know, when we have a heart attack, you end up having scarring and remodeling. Um, or adverse remodeling, that dilation, we think these sympathetics can help prevent that. So you might see patients after the MI given that um, to prevent that remodeling. Now there's two categories. Again, we talked about the specific and non-specific. So the specific ones you'll see, and it's probably the most common meds out there, metropolol, again, generic name, family of med, olol, easy way to identify it. Uh, the brand name we'll often see is a little presser. Tenolol is another one. Uh, that's often actually used as an anti-anxiety medication in very low dosages. But uh, the non-specifics will see carvedilol, propenolol, but they're all the same family of meds. Again, that LOL really is, is a dead giveaway. When you see that, think sympathetic. And when you think sympathetic, think of what it's going to do to, it's going to lice, right, or reduce the effects of the sympathetic nervous system. Now, um, beta blockers typically will, will be cautious when with patients with really bad kidneys or poor kidney function um, because they kind of beat up the kidneys and with, with chronic use um, and with patients with pulmonary issues because even though we've got like specific types, they can creep into the beta-2 receptors in the lungs, which if they get um, blocked will cause bronchoconstriction because beta-2 receptors dilate the airways. If we block them, it's going to cause constriction, so it can cause some breathing problems especially in patients that are susceptible to it already, like those with COPD or asthma. You gotta be careful with that. 
even with those selective ones, but especially with non-selective beta blockers. Um, the biggest thing for in terms of exercise, because they suppress the sympathetic nervous system, that sympathetic, global sympathetic response, which increases heart rate as we exercise, is attenuated um, because we're, we're blocking those sympathetic, you know, those adrenergic receptors, those beta-1 receptors. So the heart rate response is suppressed, as well as the maximum heart rate is suppressed. And we actually might even see the blood pressure response to be a little bit attenuated as well because of we're kind of pumping the brakes, basically, on the sympathetic nervous system. Now... There are also patholetics uh, that block the alpha receptors. Um, we've got alpha-1 blockers. Remember, alpha-1s are, are what we see in the periphery. That's what epinephrine bonds to to cause constriction. Now, uh, we can block those. Uh, their dead giveaway is zosin, Z-O-S-I-N. Uh, these, again, by blocking the alpha-1 receptors, norepinephrine you know, can't get to it. Um, to cause it to constrict, so it will cause vasodilation, thus reducing total peripheral resistance and reducing blood pressure. Uh, very rarely prescribed as a standalone med, often given with other medications. Uh, you may also see it be used to treat benign, uh, uh, benign prostate hypertrophy. And again, the most common ones you'll see are doxazosin, also known as cardurin, cardura, and uh, prazosin, or minipress. Again, zosin, dead giveaway, alpha-1 blocker. You might also see alpha-2 agonists, uh, these aren't really sympatholytics per se. Um, they act on alpha-2 receptors, but really more in the brain, essentially mediated. Um, and uh, they are you know, not really often used. The most common one you'll see there is clonidine or catapress. It's blood pressure medication, um, a little bit different by acting kind of on the vasomotor centers in the brainstem versus acting on tissue receptors. And then we'll get into our ACE inhibitors, right? So ACE inhibitors, again, will block the, you know, the angiotensin converting enzyme, which, you know, we, we you know, are in the surface of the endothelium, in the lung, in the, in the kidneys, um, which convert angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. And remember, angiotensin 2 has those profound effects on blood pressure. Now, ACE inhibitors, their dead giveaway for their suffix is PRIL, right? So that generic brand or generic name, Prill, anytime you see that, you should probably think ACE inhibitors, right? Um, they block, again, that enzymatic conversion of ANG1 to ANG2, which will lower blood pressure. And we actually find it has lower side effects than um, other than orthostasis. It's, it's, you know, it's generally pretty well tolerated. It's a very potent afterload reducer. So we see this given in patients with heart failure. We'll talk about like why later on, but patients with heart failure are afterload sensitive. So if we, you know, they don't do really well when afterload is high or, or workload is high. So if we reduce that, they do really well with that, with these medications. Um, and we often see this also given after um, MIs. So the most common ones uh, we'll see, probably the, probably the most common in, in practice is uh, lisinopril, right? Again, pril, dead giveaway for ACE inhibitor, also known as zestril. There's also uh, ketopapril and lanopril, again, dead giveaway. Anytime you see pril, think ACE inhibitor, think it's blocking, converting ANG1 to ANG2, right? And if we block the production of ANG2 or reduce the production of ANG2, it's going to, again, do have all these profound effects. And really, you know, the big thing is, re you know, reducing uh, vasoconstriction, reducing sympathetic activity, um, but they're yeah, really, really big at reducing afterload, or preventing vasoconstricting and reducing blood pressure. Very, very effective. Now, we also think that uh, ACE inhibitors, they have other effects besides just blocking ACE. Um, they block the uh, reuptake of um, bradykine and substance P, which are vasodilators as well. Uh, so we think by blocking ACE, um, which would break those down, you end up having uh, effects locally. However, there are some patients that may be more sensitive to this, and when ACE is blocked, they have a buildup, basically, of bradykinin and substance P, which can lead to angioedema, which can be very dangerous, um, especially if you get swelling in the, in the tongue, which can occlude the airways, um, and uh, that's a bit of a problem. So uh, often patients who, you know, are, you know are, have that response, that, you know, to, or, or have those problems with ACE inhibitors are given ARBs. Um, or, or angiotensin-2 receptor blockers, or ARBs, 
Um, they have almost the same exact effects as ACE inhibitors, but they don't block ACE, they block the receptor sites for ANG2, right? So don't block ACE. So ACE can still have its effects on um, bradykinin, you know, and substance P. So we don't have that same risk of angioedema. Um, and with this, we're just preventing ANG2 from blocking or getting to all those receptors. We're blocking it. So not blocking ACE, we're blocking ANG2 with an ARB. Its dead giveaway is Sartan. Um, anytime you see that at the end of a generic med, think ARB. The most common one is Losartan, Kozar. You might also see Valsartan or Diovan. Um, again, dead giveaway, Sartan, think ARB. Again, similar effects as an ACE inhibitor, but we're not blocking ACE, we're blocking ANG2. And it's often given in patients who had those side effects of angioedema. They start getting a cough, which is, may often be the first sign of that negative, that really dangerous side effect of angioedema um, due to ACE inhibitors. Uh, you may also see this in patients with obstructive, uh, using obstructive sleep apnea as well, but um, for some of the side effects related to sleep apnea. Um, other hypertension meds you might see are calcium channel blockers, uh, which block you know, the calcium entering the vascular smooth muscles. So if we block calcium, we prevent contraction. Yeah, it's used for hypertension. It's also an anti aginal because it's an anti vasospasm uh, med. So we can help restore blood flow by keeping those blood vessels dilated in the, you know, the coronaries. Um, it reduces contractile force too. So in patients that again, like in heart failure, which already have poor contractility, these typically aren't recommended to be used. Um, and in fact, are contraindicated. So you typically don't see them in heart failure, but you might see this given in a patient um, with, um, you know, with hypertension um, or maybe stable angina, something of that nature. Uh, common suffix is dipene. Probably the most common one you'll see is amlodipine. Um, and there's dilatazem as well and verapamil. There, there's other meds in this family. Um, you know, they, you know, their, their suffix, obviously these are a little bit different, but this is a pretty dead giveaway. That's a casting channel blocker. These are three that would just kind of know or, or recognize, especially for rapamil. Um, that's a pretty common one that's used in practice. And then other hypertensive meds, hydralazine. Uh, you probably won't see this on a medical chart for most patients. This is really used to treat hypertension emergencies. It's a direct acting smooth muscle relaxant. So it's not like the same kind of thing. It's not really going after receptors and stuff like that, like our calcium channel receptors, beta blockers, all this stuff. It's, it's a little bit, it's direct acting on the smooth muscle. Um, and it uh, it's really effective for you know, reducing blood pressure, really more in emerging states, hydralazine. And then um, again, just things to consider, uh, alpha blockers, again, will have that, you know, Dilation that will will on in the in the smooth muscle in the in the um, peripheral vasculature. Beta blockers may impair thermoregulation, which is mediated by, mediated by your sympathetic nervous system. In general, these patients, you want to make sure that we're gradually progressing. You know, ramping up exercise, ramping down because of you know the effects on blood pressure, um, especially beta blockers, where the heart rate response is also going to be suppressed too. So that's hypertension medications in a nutshell. And next we'll get into some other medications that you'll see often used to treat patients with cardiac disease, uh, cardiac diseases rather.